All right, good afternoon. What a gorgeous day. Thank you. Come to the Gospel of John and turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. And before I start reading, let's just ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to appear in your word, and we pray that we be caught up with, with your son in this study, that we might uh, really appreciate him as the Son of God in all of his glories. Pray, Father, you'd help us understand the word, help your servant to speak the truth uh, with clarity. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, so we're, uh, we're at the uh, fourth evangelist record, the Gospel of John. We've looked at Matthew, we've looked at Mark and Luke. These are called the synoptic Gospels because they're similar in many aspects. Uh, much of the content of the book of Mark you can find in Matthew. But we come to John. John is something uh, unique, not like the other Gospels at all. We start out in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him. Nothing was made that was made. In him was life, the life was in the light of men. And so uh, that's quite a unique start compared to the other Gospels. We don't have any genealogies, we don't have uh, the birth record of Christ. Uh, John goes all the way back before there was even time and speaks of God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word. Uh, by the way, the Jehovah Witnesses, and I'm sure many of you know this, take out the definite article right? In verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they'll take out the the, the definite article, and put A. Well, there is a definite article all the way through in that verse. And so if they try to pull that on you, you can uh, say, well, you know, the, the Greek text actually has definite articles before uh, logos or the Word. All right, so we're looking at John. Uh, Matthew presents the Lord to a Jewish audience as the son of David. Mark presents uh, Christ to the Roman audience as a lowly servant of Jehovah. Luke is presenting to the Greeks or the Gentiles as uh, the son of man. But when we come to John, John has that heavenly view of the Lord, and he is the son of God. It's interesting that in John, then, we find the statement of the Lord Jesus being the Son of God ten times, in Luke seven times, Matthew eight times, and Mark three. One of the unique things about the Gospel of John, when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, the timing, the references are always in the Jewish uh, chronology, all right? So the Jewish day started at 6 p.m., and so the, the 12th hour would be 6 in the morning, all right? So when you get to John, he, uh, he's writing to the whole world. The uh, world uh, is found 80 times in John's Gospel. You'll find it only 18 times in Matthew, 10 times in Luke, and 5 times in Mark. So he's presenting Christ as the Son of God to the whole world, and he uses the Roman a timetable, the, the clock that basically governed the political system of the world at that day. So sometimes it looks like there's disagreement between the gospel accounts. It's not. There's just a different time reckoning. John uses the Roman standard, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke use the Jewish standard. So hopefully that will help. Again, skeptics will look at those kinds of things and say, well, see, there's a disagreement. But if we look more deeply, there is a reason for it. John was written by the disciple John, the beloved disciple. It's interesting that he never refers to himself by his <coughs> personal name through the entire book. He's always the beloved disciple. He's the disciple that laid his head on the bosom of the Lord Jesus the night before crucifixion. 
Can you imagine listening to the biggest heart in the universe pumping redeeming blood? And that's the resting place that John wanted in the bosom of his Savior. By the way, I think Judas was sitting next to him on his uh, left side. That would have been the place of the honored guest. Judas could have done that, but he chose not to. John did. So he's the beloved disciple. Now, Jewish claims on Christ are purely fleshly, but true believers relate to him as the Son of God. And so we've seen a lot of religiosity out of Israel, a lot of rejection, but true believers appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ for how he's presented in Scripture. And I mentioned before that when JWs come to uh, our door, I invariably will go to John 8, 24, and the Lord Jesus said, unless you believe I am, you shall perish in your sins. If we don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you'll perish in your sins. John, in his epistles, his first epistle, picks this up in chapter 2 and 4, this, the, the sin of Antichrist, or the spirit of Antichrist, is denying that the Son of God came from heaven to the earth. That's the spirit of Antichrist. It was alive and well in John's day, and it's alive and well today it's also. I think I, that's a Kansas uh, animation, tornado animation there. All right, um, unique, uniquenesses. We're going to talk... Uh, number of aspects of what's unique about the Gospel of John. Um, John is vastly different he, than the Synoptic Gospels. He has an exalted tone, shows the divine glory of Christ. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on showing the different um, attributes of deity that John brings out in his record. It's only in John that we read of the only begotten Son, the only begotten of the Father. Nowhere else in the New Testament except in 1 John do we even read that kind of language. Now, the idea of begotten is, means unique, right? In Hebrews chapter 11, we read that Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son. Well, as Mike was sharing with us, Abraham had another son, right? His name was Ishmael, but Ishmael was a product of the flesh, and as we saw in Galatians 4, he's held up that way. Fleshly intentions, fleshly wisdom, not in the promises of God. And so there was a lapse of Abraham when he listened to Sarah and took Hagar as a concubine, and the product was Ishmael. But that was not God's plan. That was the flesh. And Ishmael is used as a symbol of the flesh all the way throughout Scripture. So when we get into Hebrews 11, we read that Isaac was... Abraham's only begotten son, begotten, unique. Isaac was the son of promise, and from God's perspective, Isaac is the only begotten son. And so begotten means unique. The Lord Jesus is um, the only, he's the unique son of God. He's not one of 150 million spiritual children or Lucifer's or his brother like the Mormons teach. He is the unique, eternal son of God. There's also no parables in John's Gospel. Now, in some of your translation, you may have the Greek word uh, paroemia translated as parable, but it's not the normal word that's translated from the Greek to the English as parable when you look at the Synoptic Gospels. And the word really means proverb or a dark saying. And so when it's used in John 10, it's not... Um, a parable, the whole teaching of the Good Shepherd is an allegory. It's revealing the deep secrets of, of our Good Shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. Matter of fact, let's just take a look at it. I'm going to take a little extra time just for some devotional nuggets in this because I think um, this is a great opportunity just to get more excited about the Lord. Uh, John 10. He says in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly, that they may have life. That's doise, and it means a life worth living, abundant life. 
Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Well, that's suke. That's often translated soul. It's the whole life. And so in this allegorical teaching of the good shepherd laying his, down his life for the sheep, we see that the Lord Jesus gave his whole life that we might have a life of abundancy, a life worth living. Two different words there for life. And uh, as you go through there, you'll see uh, Doise again appearing in verse 28. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And so the Lord Jesus gave his whole life. He went to the cross. He suffered on our behalf. He gave everything he had. Um, he was stripped of everything. The only thing he had left was to give his life. And he gave his whole life uh, that we might have an eternal life worth living, the abundant life. And that's what the Lord has given to us. As um, Mercer's already brought out, John is also dispensational in content. Uh, we see this a lot of specific rejections in chapter 12. But look back in chapter 1. John wastes no time. Now, John would be writing this 60 years after the events, right? Uh, John's an older man now, probably around 80. And so in chapter 1, he just he's telling the, uh, about the Lord that he is the, the word. Uh, nothing what was made was made, everything was made was made by him. And there, without him, nothing was made. He's uh, with God from the beginning. He is the Son of God. He's the Word of God. And then John says this, verse 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Well, again, he's talking about the Jewish rejection. And John's just, um, he's kind of giving a, a foreshadowing of how things are going to go. The Lord came, uh, the Word of God came, and as a result, there was rejection. His own received him not. He's going to his father's house, prepare a place, and then he will return. We read that in John uh, 14, 3. And then in that passage that we were just in, in John 16, again, we get a dispensational teaching. Uh, again, the king was rejected. He goes to his father's house, but he's coming back. Right now, he is on his father's throne, but he's coming back to have a literal, earthly, political kingdom. And so we read, other sheep I have... They are not of this fold, speaking of the Jewish fold, they also, I must bring, they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, a Christian fold, and one shepherd. And so um, Matthew, very dispensational. John also has quite a bit of dispensational content. Only in John do we get uh, attain the full revelation of the Holy Spirit to believers. He's the paracletus. He is the legal um, <coughs> supporter. He is the comforter. Uh, he's the legal representative, the advocate, as John would uh, trans it's translate in our Bibles in 1 John, that word is advocate. And so um, the Lord Jesus said, there's someone coming that is going to help you. He's the comforter. He's the advocate. He will teach you all truth. He will speak of me. He won't speak of himself. Um, he's the one that will help you say when you don't know what to answer, kings and so forth, when you're brought before them. He is, but I must <coughs> leave before he can come. And so the Lord had to go to the cross. Uh, he had to suffer. He'd be raised up. And then the comforter, the advocate would come. And so only John reveals that to us. The other <coughs> gospel accounts don't reveal that. Only in John is Christ revealed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the Word of God. He's the bread from heaven. And one of the things I like, you know, Matthew is, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, and so he's bringing all these Old Testament prophecies into his record and saying, the Lord fulfilled this prophecy, the Lord fulfilled that prophecy, and he's appealing to the Jewish mindset. He's using Old Testament scripture 
to show that Jesus is the son of David. He is the Messiah. But in John, John uh, speaks to a lot of the types. Let's look at John 3 for a moment. If, if you're not familiar with that word, it comes from the Greek word tupos. When Thomas was not present, uh, when the Lord appeared to his disciples the first time, um, he's, when they did come in and talk to the disciples, the disciples said, hey, the Lord is raised. He's alive. He's resurrected. And Thomas said, well, unless I feel the, the prints of the nails in his hand, in his side, I won't believe. And that word for print is tupos. And so if I take a, a square nail and I pound it between the radius and ulna, it leaves a square print. The, the hole, the square hole, is not the nail, but it gives evidence of the nail. And that's what a type is. It's not the real, but it gives evidence of the real. And so we have all these beautiful pictures in John's Gospel of types, um, where the Lord, mainly from the Old Testament, is fulfilling the typology that was represented earlier. So there's a, a classic one in uh, John chapter 3. Said, uh, the Lord is speaking to Nic Nicodemus here. He says, in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so John is referring back to this story that happened in the book of Numbers. The, the Israelites were complaining and murmuring against the Lord, and so he sends these fiery serpents among them. And if you got bit, you died. And so after people started dying, they started repenting and, and pleading for mercy, and God shows Moses the solution. He says, make a bronze serpent, put it up on a high pole in the midst of the camp, and if someone is bit by a serpent, instead of dying, they can come and say, I want Jehovah's provision of salvation, and look at the bronze serpent. Just an act of faith. And if they did that, they lived. They didn't die. And so the Lord is saying, well, I'm going to be like that bronze serpent. Now, serpent, all the way from Genesis 3, represents evil, uh, sin, uh, Possibly the devil, as in Revelation, the dragon. Uh, bronze was a high-temperature amalgamation. Um, it was um, made of uh, copper and zinc, brass and copper and tin, but it took an extreme amount of temperature to get those metals to combine, the amalgamation. And so bronze throughout Scripture represents judgment because it took high-temperature heat to meet it, right? And so here you have this serpent made of bronze, it's up on a high pole, and anyone who looks at that, the Israelites would look at that, they'd be made well, they wouldn't die. And so the Lord Jesus was put up on the cross, public spectacle, and he became the sin bearer, and he took the judgment, the wrath of God for our sin. It's a beautiful picture of uh, what happened clear back in in numbers and so he is the the fulfillment of that type that old testament type and so these things are all the way through uh john's gospel let's look at another one look over in uh let's look at john 7. <coughs> so this was the feast of tabernacles For seven days, the priests would leave the temple and they would walk down on the south side, the southeast side of the, the old city of David, and they'd go down to the spring of Gahan and they would uh, scoop up water with a gold pitcher and then they would walk back up to the temple and then they would pour that water out uh, before the altar and it would run down the steps of the temple and it was to symbolize how uh, God provided for his people in the wilderness. They were without water. Uh, they were in the wilderness coming out of Egypt. There's no water to drink. You don't have water, you die. And so uh, God tells Moses, take, take your rod, the rod of authority, and strike the rock. And then water will come gushing out. 
and people will be saved. And Moses did that, and the Israelites were saved. And so for seven days, the priests did that, but on the eighth day, the last day of the feast, they didn't do that. John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I'm the rock, and I, I'm going to be struck on your behalf. And if you will come to me, I will give you satisfaction in your soul like you can never imagine. Speaking of rivers of blessing, the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And so often we'd use these Jewish traditions to, to speak of himself. The lamp lighting ceremony, uh, they would take a lot of the old priestly garb that was um, had worn itself out, and they would soak it in a flammable solution, hang it above the women's court, and they would light it. And that was to remind them of the, the pillar of fire that guided the Israelites by day. Uh, sorry, by be there by night and a, a cloud that would guide them by day. And in John 8, that's when the Lord Jesus uh, stands up and says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Isn't that great? And so he's using all these Jewish traditions and bringing out the typology of the, whole, the Old Testament to speak of himself. And so he's the vine supplying branches. Um, he's the Lamb of God, going back all the way to Leviticus, uh, not Leviticus, Exodus chapter 12, when we were introduced to the Passover Lamb. So John, he takes a lot of effort to bring out these Old Testament uh, types, speaking of the Lord Jesus and the work that he's going to do. He's the creator. We read in John 1, 3, all things were made by him, and without him was nothing, not anything made. That means he could not have made himself, right? That breaks down all ontological reckoning. Even in uh, our higher schools of learning, uh, there are dependent beings and independent beings, uh, existential causality and so forth. If someone is subject to cause and effect, they're not the superior being. They're a dependent being. If God can change in any way, his essence, his attributes, and so forth, he's not God. He's immutable, eternal, he's self-existing. And we read that this same God uh, created, speaking of the Lord Jesus, uh, created all things. He's omnipresent. We were talking about that uh, earlier in the week. Uh, great verses for this. John 1, 18, and our brother brought up John 3, 15. Uh, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. When the Lord spoke that, he was on earth, but he was still in the bosom of the Father. In John 1, 48, when Philip is brought to the Lord to meet him, uh, the Lord says, um, uh, while you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. In other words, he knew all about Philip. He knew he was a... a a, a Jew with no guile, and you were under the fig tree, and uh, he's, um, sorry, he's speaking to Nathaniel. Um, Nathaniel's like, how do you know me? How did you know these events? Well, because he is omniscient. He knew Nathaniel even before Philip brought him to him. In John 2, 24, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And then when he's speaking to the Samaritan woman, she's coming at off hours, so she doesn't have to meet the other women. And the Lord's there waiting for her. And he tells her, well, you've had five husbands, and the man that you're living with now isn't your husband. And she's amazed. And actually, this is what led to her conversion. She goes in uh, to town to give a report and says, this man told me all that I had ever done. Well, how did the Lord know that? Because he's on mission. And by the way, that day he met number seven, and that was the perfect man. Omnipotent, he said in John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and three days I will raise it up. We see him doing wonderful miracles, walking on water, feeding the multitudes, uh, moving a boat instantaneously. Actually, let's take a look at this because there's 
This is a great example of how the different gospel accounts are different and yet complement each other. A lot of time has been taken to try to harmonize the gospels, and I don't think that was the intention. I think it's good to understand the chronology between the gospel accounts, uh, but not trying to harmonize them. They each have a different presentation. So let's just take a look at this miracle. John chapter 6. Now this is after the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. John six fifteen. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because of a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. <coughs> then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land where they were going. Now let's flip over to Matthew chapter 14. Same story, same events. Matthew chapter 14. So we have the feeding of the 5,000 starting in verse 15. And we want to pick up in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. That's something that John did not record. And go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Another detail that John doesn't record. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch, by the way, what, what time is the fourth watch? Three to six, six a.m. When did the disciples get in the boat? At evening. They've been rowing for somewhere around 10 to 12 hours. And how far have they gone? Three or four miles. That's like 500 meters an hour. That's slow going, right? I've rowed a boat for about an hour and I was done. These guys have been rowing all night. They're done. They're exhausted. They're going nowhere. Now, in the fourth watch, of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. Now, Mark adds another detail that neither that John and Matthew uh, state, and that is Mark says that when the, the Lord's walking on the sea and here's the disciples over in the boat, rowing against this contrary wind, it, Mark says the Lord made as if he was going to go on by. And they called out to him. Only Mark tells us that detail. Now, the reason I wanted to, to look at the story from the different accounts, if the four Gospels had exactly the same detail in each account, what would we be suspicious of? One, just copies, right? But the fact that each one is bringing out different details and each one has a different perspective. Matthew says they worshiped him. Um, it talks about you are the Son of God and worshiped Him. Um, 
one of the things I like about this story is, did the Lord know the disciples were going to be rowing a boat into a storm? Absolutely. Set them in the boat, says go. He went up to the mountain to pray. But I would suggest, brothers, that those disciples were in the safest place on earth because they were in the will of the Lord. And so what we can learn from this is sometimes the Lord is going to send us into storms. And there are going to be times that we can get utterly exhausted by the situations. At least seven of the 12 disciples were fishermen. They, they had a great respect for the sea. They knew the danger of the sea. They knew they were in trouble. They had rode all night and only gone three or four miles. The very thing they feared is what the Lord used to bring himself to them. And oftentimes the very things that we fear is what the Lord will use to show himself to us. It's evident um, John doesn't record Peter's debut because that would be contrary to John's presentation. In the Gospel of John, the Lord does all the work, all the miracles, all the everything. Okay, He doesn't share anything. He's the one who gets all the glory. And so we have Peter's debut on the water recorded here, but he sees the winds and the waves, and he falters, and the Lord grabs him, says, uh, save me. And the Lord immediately uh, grabs him. And so we know the purpose of the storm was to grow faith. And so we should expect that. And as we pull the different teachings from the different uh, gospel accounts together, you get a better reflection of what the Lord was trying to accomplish. But I think this is a good example that you don't have the same information in each of the gospel accounts. So uh, in John, John records that after he was in the boat, he moves it instantaneously to Capernaum. Disciples are done. He just, here you go, boys. How many? They saw the storm calm. They worshiped him. And then all of a sudden the boat is moved across the sea. Matter of fact, the next day when people were coming, they said, how'd you get here? Right? They knew something was really bizarre. How did the Lord get there? They saw him go up to a mountain. The disciples get in the boat. There was this storm. And yet the Lord was in Capernaum. So uh, this shows a number of uh, supernatural feats in this uh, one story. In John uh, 10, 30, we read, I and the Father are one. The Lord Jesus is saying that. The Jews understood what he was claiming because they wanted to kill him. Several times in the Gospel of John, uh, he was talking about my Father. Now, if he would have said our Father, there wouldn't be an issue. But when he said my Father, they knew that he was making himself equal with God, a special relationship with God. And so they picked up stones. They wanted to kill him because he was blaspheming. He was uh, making himself equal with God. He is the same word as in the beginning with God. He's eternal. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. True, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. He's just. My judgment is just, 5, 30. He's holy and sinless. Uh, can you imagine any of us? Uh, saying to the group here, okay, which one of you guys convicts me of sin? Then all the hands would go up, right? <laughs> hey, I played pickleball with you today, right? I played volleyball with you. I, you know, whatever. There's tests of sanctification. We don't always pass it. But with the Lord Jesus, he could say, which of you convict me of sin? And even his adversaries couldn't point the finger at him. He had a blameless testimony. Love, John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that he might make a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he proved it. He laid his life down for his friends. Uh, John 14, we beheld his glory, the, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Not just balanced, but full of both. And uh, that's been a great convicting idea for me to try to follow, is I don't have to it's not just being truthful and, and showing grace, but it's being full of both in what we're doing. And the Lord 
uh, and each of these things, his attributes, his characteristics, were fully reflected in everything that he did. He is the unique Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, John 1.14. He that has seen me has seen the Father, John 14, 9. He was telling that to his disciples before the night before he was crucified. You've seen me. I have been a direct reflection of the Father, which is what we read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3. He came from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, and he's liking himself to the manna there. And as we eat, which he is saying appropriate by faith, then you receive everlasting life. He laid aside his glory, John 17, 5. Father, glorify thou me with thy own self of the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And he controlled time and events. They sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. He mentions the hour seven times in the Gospel of John. The last two times he mentions it, he says, my hour has come. Again, as we were talking earlier, the cross was no surprise for the Lord Jesus. Uh, he is not having this awakening as he gets older. He knew from a very young age what it, that he was on a mission for his father. Let's look at some omissions. I find this really interesting. No genealogies. Why? Because God's eternal. No need to show um, that he's the son of David, um, lineage of the Jewish kings. No need to show that he's human. John is giving us that heavenly view of the Lord Jesus. No description of his baptism. In the baptism, Christ came. He was baptized to identify with those in need, those who he came to save. So that would be a condescending record to have in John's gospel. There's no record of the temptation. Why? Because James 1, 3 tells us God cannot be tempted with evil. So John doesn't include that. No transfiguration. Now, at first we might say, well, it seems like John might include that because it's kind of like the, the blinds open up and we get to see the Shekinah within the Lord. You know, the flesh is a veil and up there on the mount it opens up. But the idea is it was up on the mount. And Christ is coming into his earthly kingdom versus John's view of Christ in his heavenly relationship. And so that's why Christ on the mountain showing his glory is, is really inferior to the heavenly scene of the divineness of the Lord. So no transfiguration, no appointing of the apostles. This is interesting in John, all the ministry and work is left in the hands of the Supreme Son. Now here's one, when I first saw it, I thought, this is so good. And John is basically giving us, if I can use the phrase, a no praying Jesus. Now, let me explain that. We find uh, seven times that the Lord prays to his Father, but it's a different word Eritao is used in John, a different word than in the Synoptic Gospels. Eritao, if, if Steve and I were sitting at the dinner table and I said, Steve, please pass me the salt, that would be an example of Eritao. I'm speaking to an equal. I'm asking Steve. If I got down on my knees and begged Steve, Steve, I need salt now, that would be the uh, closer rendition of the normal word used in the, um, the synoptics. In other words, there's a, a level, um, someone is taking a lowly state and pleading with someone that's clearly superior for blessing. And that's the word for prayer and the other. So in John, every time you see the word prayer, it's eratao, and it means to ask of an equal. John is upholding the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned uh, previously, there's no repent or forgive in John's gospel. Repent and forgive are very important words in Matthew and Luke, but John is giving us the heavenly view. And when God looks down upon the earth, all those in Adam are spiritually dead. When Nicodemus comes in John, uh, as recorded in John 3, the Lord says, you must be born again. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. 
And so all spiritually dead, you must believe the gospel to be born again. And so believing is the key word that John stresses. You're all dead. How do you resolve that? You believe on the gospel. Now, it's the same truth. I kind of like to think of, of, of like a, a hinge of truth. And if I'm pursuing this way away from God, and then I bring out under the conviction of the truth and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to turn from, I'm going to have a change of mind, a metanoia. I'm going to turn from, I'm going to repent, and then I hold on by faith to the truth. And so it's the same, it swings on the, the same hinge of truth. The gospel truth is, is causing me to repent, stand with God against myself, receive his free gift by faith. And so it's connected together. It's not that Matthew and Luke are stressing a different way to, to get saved or John stressing a different way. They're just stressing different aspects of the gospel message. You must repent to be saved. I mean, the Lord said that in the gospel of Luke several times, right? Unless you, you're perishing your sins unless you repent. But um, in John, it's believing the truth. As I mentioned, no parables and no ascension in John. Why? Because the Son of God is omnipresent. He doesn't need to ascend anywhere. And so again, John is upholding the deity of the, the Lord Jesus. So just to conclude now, I want to show you what I find really fascinating. Seven is one of the perfect numbers. It's a, a number of completeness and perfection. I find about about 20 sevens in the Gospel of John. I'm not going to list them all here, but this gives you <coughs> an idea of some of the sevens that are in John. Seven times these things I have spoken unto you appears in the Gospel of John. Seven times Christ addresses the woman at the well in John 4. By the way, in John's Gospel, 11 times the Lord speaks one-on-one -on -one to someone. He, he takes the truth of the gospel to them 11 times. Seven times he speaks to the woman at the well. Seven times Christ spoke of himself as the bread of life in John 6. Seven things the good shepherd does in John 10. Seven times Christ made reference to the hour in which he must accomplish his father's work. Seven times Christ instructed his disciples to pray in his name. By the way, you can find three times in the, uh, that upper room and then after the upper room the night before he died, John 14, 15, and 16. Seven times the word hate is found in John 15. It's the highest concentration of hate anywhere in Scripture. It's the world's hate is contrasted against the love of God uh, in Christ in John 15. Seven mysteries of the Holy Spirit to the believer are noted in John 16. Seven times Christ referred to believers as the Father's gift to him. Seven times John recorded that Christ spoke only the word of the Father. Seven times the writer of John referred to himself, but not by name. And then it's interesting, we have the seven events that pertain to Christ's ministry, which appear in all four Gospels. The ministry of John the Baptist as a forerunner of Christ, the feeding of the 5,000, Peter's confession of the Lord Jesus as being the Christ, the triumphal entry or the presentation of Messiah, what sometimes is called Palm Sunday, and then we have the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. Those seven things are in all four <laughs> gospel accounts. <coughs> so as we're winding up our study here, who is Christ? What what does the Father want us to understand? The entire Bible speaks of Christ. He is God's personal message and invitation to mankind. He is the spirit of prophecy. All promises of God are yes in him or yea in him. He is the center of prophecy and all promises are fulfilled with him. The believer's complete identity and existence abides with and in Christ. He is our peace, he is our joy, he is our hope, he is our foundation stone of faith, he is our shepherd, he is the bishop of our souls, he is the head of the church, he's our great high priest, 
our advocate with the Father and our Savior. He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the Judge of all, the Alpha and Omega, the Creator, and the only begotten Son of God. And without Christ, there's no solution to sin, no satisfaction of need, no salvation, no life, and no hope. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is what the four <clears throat> Gospels are presenting us, uh, to us of Christ and then upheld even further by the epistles and all the wonderful ways that God is using Christ to benefit us. It's an enjoyable study. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a, a good, just for my own soul, just to keep front and center what the Father wants us to appreciate about uh, the Lord Jesus. Okay, so we'll, before we pray, we'll just uh, pause any comments, questions, any, any additional